So one of the things that happened while I was at St. Ignatius in the, the years before that walkout is we had a panel. Um, there was usually two or three black students and our friend Mark was the white student who would accompany us. And we'd go to different Catholic schools in the area and have discussions about racial relations. And was this something that was sponsored by the school? Or? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're human relations folks. Yeah. And here's something that happened that I'll never forget. We were at a girls' school. I can't remember the name of the school. Uh, it was a Catholic girls' high school. And we have our discussions. We do our presentation. Then we have a Q&A. During the Q&A, this girl raised her hand and said, this question is directed to the black students. How do you keep your tails in your pants? She actually believed that we had tails. And she wanted to know how we kept our tails in our pants and were able to sit on them. Yeah, I'm not surprised in a way because I, I the, Ignorance is rampant. Ignorance is rampant. So there was, I mean, the level of, of, of miseducation and ignorance was, and still is tremendous. Amazingly, it still is tremendous. Tell me about Fred Hampton. He said to Fred, how about him and uh, what kind of interactions you might have had? The Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party um, opened in November of 1968 at 2351 Madison, at the corner of Madison and Western. I had known about the Black Panther Party from my reading. I read Rampart's magazine. Um, um, the Panthers had been known for their policing of the police in the Oakland area and really got national and international attention when they went to the Sacramento legislature arm to protest a law that would uh, um, prohibit them from carrying weapons in their policing of the police. So when I heard that the Illinois chapter opened up, I went and I joined. Um, a friend of mine described today, what did you get on the old? Yeah, I got on the bus, got on the bus, um, probably Roosevelt to, to, to Western, got off, and went and took a political education class. A class, because in order to be a, a member of the party, you had to attend political education classes. There was a reading list, you had to read, you had to be aware of what was going on. And I remember uh, meeting Fred, and Fred was a dynamic individual. Now, he was a young man. He was 21 when he was killed. But he was, as they say, an old soul. But he was a dynamic leader. He was two years older than me. Two years older than me. And um, he was the kind of person, he was the kind of speaker, he was the kind of motivator, who, if he said, I want you to go through that wall, you go through the wall and say, what's the next one? Because he would do it. I mean, he wasn't one of those... He was a lead by example kind of guy. And he, one of the rare qualities of leadership, you had in this organization a very diverse group of people in terms of mindset, education, all kinds of things. One of my friends said, when he came in there, he was like, well, I want to do it. When do we start shooting people? And the friend said, no, that's not the way we do things here. He said, he told him about the party and what the party worked and said, now, you can't join today. I want you to go and think about this and understand what we do. And if you're still interested, come on back and we'll talk. And what, what did you explain for the purposes of the record? What, what did you explain that? Well, one is, is that one, and, and this is a, a pop, popular misconception, the Black Panther Party was not an anti-white organization. We were against racism. We were against injustice. And we would work with anybody who was a, 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 with us on that. Here in Chicago, there was the Rainbow Coalition. We had alliances with Rising Up Angry, the Young Lords, the Young Patriots, SDS, and working together. In fact, there's this movie, American Revolution II. And in American Revolution II, there's a scene where, where Bob Lee and Hank Gaddis are talking to the Young Patriots and talking about why these poor Appalachian whites and black folks and the Puerto Ricans American Revolution. Yeah, in, in the American Revolution too, there's oh, another one. <laughs> <laughs> the timing's a little tough on storytelling. <laughs> well, you know something, there's a storytelling festival, a couple of them that have trains always going by. 
and it's always intriguing to watch the storytellers see how they deal with it. So, so and then the train came through. <laughs> but in American Revolution II, there's a scene where Bob Lee and Hank Gass are talking to the young patriots about why they should be working with the Black Panther Party and the Young Lords, why poor blacks, poor whites, and um, Puerto Ricans and Mexicans should be working together. And at the end of the meeting, the gentleman who conducted, who was videotaping, he interviewed this old hillbilly and said, well, what do you think about what the Panthers had to say? And he said something like, well, I guess if these black Panthers are going to support us, we should support these black Panthers. <laughs> but that was classic. And that's one of the reasons that the Black Panther Party was earmarked for destruction was because if we had bought into the idea of, okay, let's get whitey, oh, that's fine. Because therefore, we're not going to be working with people who should be working with us, people who we actually have things in common with. I'll tell you something else I only learned a year or two ago. So we have our Breakfast with Children program here in Chicago. And so two of my comrades, uh, two women Panthers, had a meeting with these businessmen in terms of uh, talking to them about supporting the Breakfast with Children program. And so they listened. And this is what they said after these women presented the Breakfast program. They said, well, if you were to have violent interactions with other black organizations, we would give you money. They wouldn't give money to support the Breakfast program. But if we would have violent interactions with other black organizations, they would give us money. Because they, again, it's that, div because it's that divide and conquer thing. We were doing just the opposite. The Black Panther Party was trying to get the Blackstone Rangers to stop being gangbangers, to stop preying on the black community, to become a political organization. The Young Lords had been a street gang that had become political. And so we were trying to work with people say, you know, we need to be working together. We need to not be attacking and, 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 and oppressing our own people. So we have a bigger enemy. And again, that was one of the reasons the Black Panther Party was earmarked for destruction. Because we were bringing people together. And back to your question about Fred. Fred was a communicator. Fred was a person who would get people to see the reality and why we should work together. And at the time Fred was assassinated, he was just about to become a national figure because he was just that dynamic a speaker. He was just that dynamic a motivator. And that's why he was killed. Because though J. Edgar Hoover had, Hoover had said, he would not allow there to be a black messiah. Martin Luther King was killed when? When he started going beyond just civil rights. When he started dealing with the issue of the war. When he started issue, uh, dealing with the issues of jobs and unions, that he was killed. Malcolm X, when was he murdered? As long as he was the, the black Muslim, um, uh, white man is the devil guy, nothing. When he got beyond that, when he started talking about working with, with progressive whites, that's when he was assassinated. And that was the reason, like I said, these leaders were killed. These organizations, like I said, if you were an organization and you were, the Blackstone Rangers, had an audience with Nixon in the White House in the, uh, it was either, I think it was in the 60s or early, late 60s, early 70s. The Republican Party gave them about a million dollars, all right? Um, ostensibly, they were supposed to try to break the Democratic organization. But you can be sure that that money went to doing things that were going to be oppressive to the black community. So they weren't being, they weren't earmarked for destruction until they started trying to act like the Panthers and thought they, that meant randomly going out and shooting cops. Yeah, so there was there was a method to the madness. Did uh, you ever attend a class that Fred Hampton taught? 
I attended. Um, or who was the teachers? Maybe? Well, I was actually I was one. Of, I became one of the uh, the teachers of the political education classes. Shortly after joining the party, I became a part of education cadre, and that was our job to teach the political education classes. And um, back to your question about Fred and personal interactions with Fred Hampton. Um, on several occasions, Fred sent me to either speak or to debate in his place. And it was an impromptu thing. I'm supposed to give a speech, I don't have time to do it, you go do it. I'm supposed to be at the state, um, I don't have time to do it, you go do it. So I had to be ready. I had to be ready. And, and to this day, I am good at impromptu everything because of that. <laughs> I was thrilled. One of the qualities of a good leader is to recognize the, the skills of the people in his organization and put that person or those persons in situations where they can succeed, where they can utilize their own skills. And that was something that Fred excelled at, especially in terms of me. Um, he recognized, I have a big mouth and a lot to talk about. All right, and he, he recognized that and he recognized my skills in, in terms of speaking and debating and what have you. Um, he was an amazing individual and the, and the idea that he was so young and he was so dynamic is, is mind-blowing, is absolutely mind-blowing. His oratory, did it remind you of other uh, black preacher 